inflation keeps prices down far more effectively. <laughs> Comrade Karanja, His Excellency says you are unbalanced. I am a man in search of man. I was never in search of God. My guest in conversation tonight is the South African writer Nadine Godema. She was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1991, only the seventh woman and the first woman in 25 years. She has combined a powerful social conscience with profound literary merit. Uh, Mrs. Godema, how, how confident, how aware or conscious have you been of being a woman and a writer? I can't really say that I have suffered um, from the fact that I'm a woman and a writer. And I appreciate very much the fact you didn't say woman writer. <laughs> You'd never say man writer, but people very often say woman writer. And I think a woman writer suggests a certain kind of, of writing. I think that um, serious writers are really androgynous beings. They are they're somehow the in the makeup both man and woman, that um, human being which is both. Uh, in your writing, you've, uh, you were sort of exposing apartheid from within, of course, placing that in, in, in the larger social, uh, the, con the consciousness of the larger social uh, human condition. How important was, was apartheid as a catalyst to your writings? It's very difficult to say because I think that all writers are profoundly affected by the structure of their society. If it happens to be a society in conflict, this, of course, impinges more closely upon the personal life. So that a writer is drawing on both, both what's happening inside and also the, the, the pressure from outside, the response to outside. So I would say that apartheid was um, a very strong influence. How far did you sort of consciously decide, perhaps, that you were going to use the, uh, the framework or, or your response to apartheid uh, to talk about life and, and, and the social condition that you were going to write about? Well, I'd never allowed that to influence my fiction. I always kept the freedom of, um, of my imagination and I think it would be fatal, it is fatal for, for writers to however passionately you feel about your cause, you mustn't allow it to make you a propagandist. Propaganda has its place in every political formation, especially in, in, uh, in, in situations of great conflict. But there are people who write propaganda, that is their job, fine and well. But I think it's absolutely wrong for um, the, uh, an imaginative writer like myself to do so because you lose your sense of truth. You have to um, make people who are on your particular political side into angels and the, the others devils. And to be the whole question of writing is that you are looking for some truth. And human beings are inconsistent. Human beings have very muddled motives. There are no angels and very few devils. Uh, your books were banned in 1958 and, and, and until 1991. Uh, so was this process of, of, of resisting, not becoming a propagandist, a conscious one? I think it came naturally to me because I began to write very young, when I was ex extremely young, and when I didn't even know what politics was, I was still um, living in that narrow white milieu on this, in this mining town where I lived. And uh, you know how you take your manners and mores from adults and from your parents? So I was in my teens before I really began to ask myself, why is it that at school we're all white? Why is it when I go to the movies on a Saturday afternoon, there are no black children there? And so on. Um, but at the beginning you take it naturally, rather as the sun comes up in the morning and goes down at night, you know, it's something that adults have decided and therefore it must be good. But um, then I began to question it, not from the theory. Political theory I read much later. But um, in my teens I began to question it from what I saw around me. I began really to see what was happening to black people, and especially the migratory mine workers. We were surrounded by them. 
you wrote your first uh, story that was published when you were 15 years old. Yes. So obviously it was a very early sensibility that was responding to the environment around you. How did the environment receive you when you first started your questioning of, well, of the status quo? I suppose it was an, an inward questioning. My parents regarded themselves as apolitical, where we all know that that is a very distinct political stance that you take. Um, my mother had an unease about black people and uh, took part in various charitable things, uh, clinics and nursery schools in the black ghetto. So that there was a move there in my mother, you know, toward some kind of feeling that there was something wrong. But she never took it as far as to question the form of government. So then it took some time for me to see that the, um, the charitable position and the treating people like human beings, it wasn't enough. That you had to oppose the regime at, at the top. You had to change the whole structure. And of course, as I grew up, it got worse and worse. Apartheid really became um, institutionalized. Racism became institutionalized. When, this, when did this sort of personal response uh, to Apartheid uh, become a more assertive activist uh, response in a larger sense? In the 50s, yes, in the 50s, because at the beginning, when, when I grew up and went to live in Johannesburg, which of course was the big city, the, the metropolis, there somehow my natural instincts, which like many artists, writers, um, by and large are not uh, people who, who conform to a certain group, whether it's religious or race, racial or whatever it is, there's a certain um, feeling of wanting to break out of this of this shell, and there I met um, Africans, Indians, who also were somehow in the arts, and I had so much more in common with them than I had with um, my peers in this mining town, where people played golf and went to the Saturday night dance. You know, it was uh, the kind of life that appealed to me, and the exchange of ideas, which I missed in that little town. Then in the 60s when the um, political conflict became more open, the African National Congress um, began then extreme, extremely active, and we went through the whole stage at the end of the 50s of the Gandhian nonviolent um, opposition, then moved slowly over to something that had to be rather uh, stronger. The people that I knew, they began to be more politicized, black people and the Indians, and they um, would get into trouble and then it became a kind of test of friendship to hide them away and to become as we all did liars you had to lie to people questioning you about your friends and you became more and more involved that's really how I was drawn in then I began to look at politics from a more theoretical point of view and to understand what was being to see the the, uh, the conflation of capitalism and racism in our country. You were of course continued to be a member of the African National Congress even when it was uh, uh, outlawed and the shift from, from Gandhian non-violence to a more activist mm. uh, strategy, how did you respond to that? Were you comfortable with that? Yes, I was because by that time I knew the leaders and really there had been as um, old Chief Latuli who was one of the first uh, presidents of the African National Congress said We've been knocking patiently on the back door for so long. There was no reply from any door. And of course, during the 60s, it was the great period when of huge removals of whole populations. So then this was happening in, uh, in Sophia Town in Johannesburg, a mile or two from, from where I lived. So that you were brought face to face with what was happening uh, to people. And that, I think, politicizes you and makes you into an activist. You mentioned the relationship between capitalism and, and apartheid. Uh, to what extent do you think that the, uh, the positions that the rest of the world took, particularly the capitalist countries, at least in their public posturings uh, against apartheid, in fact made an impact? Or was it largely an internal process? That no, realized? of course, unfortunately, the, the Western world was very, very slow. Years and years went by, all the years of those mass removals of people. <clears throat> which was a terrible act, as bad as any act of war almost. During those years, um, America and England 
kept relations with the white South African regime and even refused to meet our leaders in exile. Dr. Dadu was in exile, one of the first, um, then um, Oliver Tambo was in exile, but you couldn't get the, anybody even um, on a slightly lower level, a junior minister in, in the British administration, to, to meet these people. They were the, the, uh, the rebels and the outlaws. It took a very long time for, for that to change. But slowly it did change, and of course sanctions became the most important thing. Sanctions from the outside, the economic decline, the tremendous cost of buying oil on the black market all the time with enormous prices and from the biggest crooks in the world. The oil mafia has to be, one has to look into to see what they were like. And on the other hand, the growing pressure, the growing courage and confidence of um, black people of all shades of colour. And of course we had something remarkable and unique in Africa, and that was marvellous cooperation between the Africans and the Indians, and quite a lot of whites, a small group of whites. If you look at what happened in Uganda, in Kenya, especially with the Indian population. But the difference is, of course, that the, right from the days of Gandhi's time there, he's 14 years there, um, the Indians took political responsibility. They threw in their lot, even though the apartheid laws were less strict for them, they were still discriminated against. So that is how the unity was brought about between the Indian Congress and the African National Congress and the trade unions. So we had a unique force cohering. Uh, what do you think is Gandhi's influence in, in, in contemporary South Africa? Oh, absolutely. Very strong. And indeed, some people, some very young people, um, don't even know that they've absorbed the Gandhian philosophy. And um, I think it's been a, a marvellous tempering influence all along, even though the struggle inevitably had to become violent. But it was never violence on a really enormous scale. The violence on an enormous scale came from the state. And I'm quite sure that the, uh, the, the Gandhian influence is really very, very strong there. What kind of personal sacrifices do you think you had to make uh, to stand up against, in a sense, your own? I don't like to exaggerate them. Uh, there were so many people much braver than I. Most people have uh, the point of no return. But of course, as years went by, that um, point of no return got further and further away. Um, and when the, and one was frightened, yes. You take risks and then you don't only risk yourself, you risk your family. And I was playing um, a kind of um, betting game with myself that as I became better known as a writer, this might be some protection for me. It was a protection in the sense that I kept my passport. It didn't stop me um, in mo moving around. But I knew that like everybody else who was involved, I was being watched at home. And um, then the, the real climax came for me when there was a big treason trial and the people who were on trial, we have a system whereby at the end, before the judge gives, judges give their judgment, then the, uh, the accused can call people to, to make a plea in, in mitigation for them. Mm -hmm. So they asked for me, I was very touched and um, I had a very tough time with, with the prosecutor because the African National Congress, of course, was banned. And in Konto Wisizwi, the guerrilla army, was absolutely something that you couldn't have anything to do with at all. And the prosecutor said, is Nelson Mandela your leader? And I said, yes, he is. And is in Konto Wisizwi your army? And I said, yes, it is. So that was um, quite a dangerous thing to do, but I got away with it. And once the, the change came, um, I felt tremendously glad, very humble about it, but glad that I hadn't gone into exile, that I had stayed and um, done something. Though you never feel you've done enough in comparison with people like Mandela and others who simply spent the whole of their middle life in prison. You mentioned this aspect of uh, uh, consciously avoiding being a propagandist uh, and your 
larger commitment to, to sort of mm. combat uh, apartheid. Uh, and you, you established a, a Congress of African Writers. Uh, how, what kind of role do you think literature made uh, in, in, in the struggle and in the movement? Well, we used to say that culture was an arm of the struggle. And although that sounds a gung-ho sort of mm. cliche, it, was, it really was true. Um, particularly, I would say, in the theatre. Because somehow the government, I suppose quite rightly in a way, though they underestimated the power of this, thought that it's only in the big towns that there were places where people just defied the fact that black and white couldn't perform in a play together or couldn't use a hall together. We somehow got round this. And people started to workshop their own plays instead of, as the whites did, putting on plays that came from the West End or from Greenwich Village or somewhere, yes. And so people were, um, as Brecht put it, dramatizing their own lives. They were using what was in their lives. And I think when people came along and saw that, all the things that were tied up inside them, their frustrations and their fear, it gave them courage. And the same thing to a certain extent with, uh, with our writings, black and white. Your writings were banned in South Africa. Uh, and they were being sold and available in, in, mm. in, in the West and outside Africa and all over the world, in fact. How conscious were you of that readership when you were writing? Not at all. And I think it's fatal. Quite often, if you, I'm sure if you're writing uh, in India or you're writing in, in um, Bulgaria or you're writing in South Africa, there are certain references which will not be familiar. But the moment you've been explaining, you know, the, the author's coming in and, and tapping you on the shoulder and say, you see, this is like that. And this is one of the skills a writer has to acquire, that somehow people will pick up from the context. And if they miss a nuance here or there, you can't help it. So that um, I have really ignored that, or I've tried to find a way out of it. I wrote a novel called Burger's Daughter, and there um, the main character sometimes narrates an event herself, and other times there are other people saying how it looked to them. It's, it seems to be a different story. And when it came to um, having to give explanation about her father, who was a revolutionary and who was in prison, to have a chapter giving his history, he was a communist, would have been not a novel. That's a tract again. So I thought long and hard about that. And then I thought about the lives of people like that, that I knew. If they died or if they went into exile, there would be someone who wanted to write about them. And to whom would they go but to the daughter? So that gave me an opportunity. Then the daughter has to start looking through her father's letters and thinking about things that happened. So I got over that one. <laughs> um, can you share with us the process of writing? Uh, how, does it, how does it happen for you? Uh, do you plan a novel uh, in, its, in, its, in its outline structure, form? Uh, how does it develop? Uh, do you start writing and let it flow? I don't make a plan chapter by chapter. Some people do, but I don't do that. To me, um, here's the beginning, and there is the end. And then I, I, this is all not written down. This is all happening when I'm thinking. And then there are stations on the way, so to speak. But I don't know when I begin how I'm going to get from there to there or here to here. But it is, the, the, the end of it is there. I always know the end mm -hmm. when, I'm, when I do the beginning. And I usually know the title. Mm -hmm. And people are often surprised at this. But to me, unless I know the title, I don't really know what I want to write about. Because the title should be the essence of what there is. What takes uh, precedence here? The storyline, the action that, that, that the novel uh, will follow? Uh, or would you feel you have something to say and then look for a structure in which to say it? No, it starts with people. Mm -hmm. And um, what they represent as personalities and what they represent in their society. And I think I would have written like that even if I hadn't lived in a place of tremendous conflict. But of course, what a system like apartheid did to people, even in their most personal relationships. I've often likened it to how when a baby is born and passes down the birth canal, that's when your head gets shaped, apparently. But I think in South Africa, your head, what was in your head, got shaped again by the pressures of apartheid. The little prejudices, the mistrust, and so on. 
And when you've sort of uh, written this, this draft, do you, how, how often do you go over it? And, um, I don't rewrite a lot at all, no. When I start, I go straight through. But I regard myself as a slow writer. I would take three years, perhaps, to write a novel, sometimes four years. Um, I'm definitely a, a slow writer. Whose admiration do you feel you, you, you need the most when you have written uh, a novel? Uh, is, is the process complete for you when you've written it or when it's uh, been received or read by uh, the people you've uh, reached out to? No, I think it's rather like one's emotions, you know. Um, I, only I know what I wanted to do. So I'm my, my worst critic, so to speak. I mean, I'm, I'm the most harsh critic. And when it's finished, then I can see, sometimes perhaps it's, it's turned out slightly differently, but better than I thought it would. At other times I see things that, um, you know, that, that are missing. In this latest novel that I published, which is called None to Accompany Me, Looking back at it now, I feel that the, the character of the one man, uh, somehow he, he fades out, that he, he ought to be more present, that one doesn't really know enough about him, even if it's somebody who is rather an evasive person. It's for the writer to, to tease this out. Do you go back to, to a work you've written several years ago and felt, ah, that worked well and, and this didn't? To reread it? Yes. No, I would only do that if, uh, if I'm going to give a reading. Then I would look for a chapter and find some surprising things. And sometimes with my early stories, you know, I began to write stories. I've written nine books of short stories. Some of those early stories, though they seem naive in some ways, they've got a freshness that I look and think we're really, that was really good. I haven't got that eye anymore. You, my narrative power has grown. I d it was not strong at the beginning. But I suppose when you're young, very young, you know, everything, everything you see is new to you. Every little human foible is new. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, now that the, that the social context environment has changed in South Africa, uh, what kind of impulses do you think you might now be moved by, or are you being moved by, uh, compared to 10 years ago? Well, the um, difference between the book, this Nun to Accompany, which is in my latest book, it, it is set indeed in the period of transition. So that some of the things that intrigue me more and more, and that I hope many writers will tackle, um, they are dealt with in that book at the stage that they are now. You know, the whole thing of, of the exiles coming back, the political exiles, with a dream of what home's going to be like. But home has changed. There were these enormous removals of people. Perhaps home isn't there anymore. It's become something else. And the family and the friends have, have moved off. And the big um, rush to the cities that everybody has gone through. So that's one thing that you see all sorts of strange situations. In that book, for instance, something quite common, what the characters, it's common in real life. And that is um, couples who have had children in their years overseas and these children go to school in England in Sweden some I know there are, are black kids who speak Swedish as, as a second language but do not know Zulu or Tswana or Tkosa now these children come back and they have no ties to so I've seen some very interesting things especially with adolescents it can be quite difficult for them to settle down then there are others young friends that I know, young writers, whose dream was to get out of the ghetto. So you move into high-rise section of Johannesburg and then you find all the neighborliness is gone. You don't know who lives next door. You can't say, um, look, could you look after our baby? We want to go out tonight. So there are wonderful things to write about and the tensions too. Mm -hmm. How optimistic do you feel about the future of South Africa now? I think that um, people abroad are much too pessimistic. And I get quite angry. We had 350 years of oppression. We've had not even two years. We've had something like 19 months. And we're supposed to have done everything. To have given everybody a job, to have built houses for everybody. It's quite impossible to do that in that short time. 
And then, of course, as usual, when, uh, when the, the oppressor is overthrown, that loyalty that makes people stick together now gets broken up by ambitions, rivalries, and people are human. Mm -hmm. I think African National Congress is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Of all the political movements I know that went into exile, they never divided. They were not, um, they didn't, they were not schismatic at all, which is a, a wonderful tribute to people like Oliver Tambo and others. When you're not being um, a writer and, 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 and a, what's well, shall I say, political activist and concerned about the social and political situation, what are you, what are you being? If, if you were to meet someone at a party, and, and that would be very unlikely, but if they didn't know you and, and you had to say, introduce yourself, what would you introduce yourself as, as being a writer? I'd just say I'm a writer, yes. Mm. And would exchange the usual social chat. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> what other writers do you read? Oh, everything that I can lay my hands on, you know. Mm. Have you read any of the Indian writing in English? Yes, I have, but it, there isn't really very much, and I wish, you know, that I had read more. Mm -hmm. And of course, I've read all the, the old ones, the classics, you know. Tagore, I've, I've read the Gita, mm -hmm. even when I was quite young. Um, Anand, um, Narayan, I absolutely love. Indeed, I didn't know that he was so old and so far away because I'd hoped that I might see him. I met him a few years ago in, in America. A marvelous writer in a very quiet way, especially when you'd go through villages and you think of uh, the magician of Malgudi and, and others. And um, of course, those in exile. Salman Rushdie is a friend of mine, and I've been, and still am, immensely distressed about his, uh, his position. Because I think he is one of the handful of really important living writers. He is a remarkable writer. But what has been done to him is, is a kind of crucifixion. It's absolutely terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, as, 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 as a writer, um, what, what future ambitions do you have for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose always the same thing to write a better book than the last one. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.